Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Wednesday, 14 February 2024. Happy Valentine's Day. Given how we celebrate Valentine's Day today, it may seem strange to recall that February 14th is the anniversary of the martyrdom of St. Valentine. With his martyrdom, the date of his martyrdom made into his official feast date in the calendar. According to one tradition, St. Valentine was martyred in 269 AD, making this the 1,755th anniversary of his martyrdom. As difficult as it is for us as human beings to wrap our heads around the idea of death, traditions around martyrdom make it partially comprehensible. One death is something we think that we can understand. Stalin is supposed to have said that one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And this kind of summarizes our ambiguity over the idea of mass death. And Valentine's Day is not only the day of an individual martyrdom, it's also a day of mass death. On Wednesday, 14 February 1945, most of the city of Dresden was destroyed in a British firebombing raid. It was part of an organized campaign extending over three days, February 13th, 14th, and 15th, 1945. This was among the most devastating aerial bombing operations of the Second World War. It is not known how many people died in the Dresden air raid, and there are conflicting estimates, and these estimates range over an order of magnitude, so the, the estimates are quite different. Less than a month after the Dresden raid, Operation Meeting House was an air raid over Tokyo on the 9th and 10th of March, 1945. It was organized by Curtis LeMay, who later organized the Strategic Air Command during the Cold War. Operation Meeting House may have killed more people than Dresden. It's frequently estimated that 90 to 100,000 civilians were killed in the firebombing of Tokyo. But when large cities are destroyed rapidly, it's almost impossible to count the dead. Both the British and the Americans attempted precision bombing earlier in the Second World War, but it was largely unsuccessful in terms of ending war industries. So what came to be called area bombing, and also known as de-housing, justified on the basis of disrupting war industries, was then then became the, the, the standard method, and it eventually expanded into the planned destruction of entire cities. And this proved to be much more successful in stopping war production. Dresden was part of this development, near the end of the development, you could say. And it was one of the, it was the most devastating air raid in Europe. Because of the scope of destruction of Dresden, many books have been written about it. Firestorm, Allied Air Power and the Destruction of Dresden by Marshall de Brühl. The Fire in the Darkness, The Browning of Dresden, 1945, by Sinclair McKay. Dresden, Tuesday, February 13th, 1945, by Frederick Taylor. Firestorm, The Bombing of Dresden, 1945, by Paul Addison and Jeremy Krang. Dresden, 1945, The Devil's Tinderbox, by Alexander McKee. That was the book that brought my awareness to it. And, of course, Kurt Vonnegut's novel, Slaughterhouse Five, published in 1969, was based on his personal experience. Vonnegut was a prisoner of war, was being held in Slaughterhouse Five in Dresden, and he participated in the cleanup, the initial cleanup of the city after the bombing. The controversial historian David Irvine, Irving was among the earliest to write about the destruction of, uh, of, of Dresden in The Destruction of Dresden, published in 1963. And that was published at a time when historians largely avoided the in in incident. But even before that, uh, Sir Arthur Harris wrote about it in his 1947 book, Bomber Offensive. But Bomber Offensive isn't specifically about Dresden, although it does cover Dresden among other campaigns. Arthur Harris, the author, Sir Arthur Harris, was commander in chief of RAF Bomber Command 
and became known as Bomber Harris because of his prosecution of the bombing campaign during the Second World War. Harris became so associated in the public mind with this bombing campaign and devastation that after the war, he moved to South Africa to try to distance himself from that association. In his book, he wrote, quote, I was called upon to attack Dresden. This was considered a target of the first importance for the offensive on the Eastern Front. Dresden had by this time become the main center of communications for the defense of Germany on the southern half of the Eastern Front, and it was considered that a heavy air attack would disorganize these communications and also make Dresden useless as a controlling center for the defense. It was also by far the largest city in Germany. The pre-war population was 630,000, which had been left intact. It had never before been bombed. As a large center of war industry it was also of the highest important importance. An attack on the night of February 13th and 14th by just over 800 aircraft bombing in two sections in order to get the night fighters dispersed and grounded before the second attack was almost as overwhelming in its effect as the Battle of Hamburg, though the area of devastation, 1,600 acres, was considerably, considerably less. There was, it appears, a fire typhoon, and the effect on German morale, not only in Dresden, but in far distant parts of the country, was extremely serious, unquote. Harris calls the effect of the bombing a fire typhoon. We now call it a firestorm. The typhoon is no longer widely used. And it needs to be noted that a technique was developed to intentionally create a firestorm and bombing. First, the first group of planes would drop flares to mark the target. Then they dropped incendiaries in several waves. And while dropping the incendiaries, they kept smaller aircraft circling the city to keep the, keep the bombing contained within as tightly clustered an area as possible to focus the incendiaries in one place. And every once in a while, they would continue to drop conventional explosives to limit fire suppression efforts. So limiting fire suppression, that means keeping people scared and in their air raid shelters, because if you just drop incendiaries and move on, people will leave their shelters and put out the fires and probably prevent a firestorm from happening. In the same book by Harris, they just quoted a moment ago, he quoted a German document that became public after the war. Quote, through the union of a number of fires, the air gets so hot that on account of its decreasing specific weight, it receives a terrific momentum, which in its turn causes other surrounding air to be sucked towards the center. By that suction, combined with the enormous difference in temperature, 600 to 1000 degrees centigrade, Tempests are caused which go beyond their meteorological counterparts. In a built up area, the suction could not follow its shortest course, but the overheated air stormed through the street with immense force, taking along not only sparks, but burning timber and roof beams. So spreading the fire farther and farther, developing in a short time into a fire typhoon, such as was never before witnessed, against which every human resistance was quite useless." Unquote. That particular account of a firestorm was written about, not about Dresden, but about Hamburg. On the night of the 27th of July, 1943, Hamburg had been targeted in an incendiary attack. Uh, and, and the British also used in the Hamburg attack another new technology, which was radar confusing chaff that was called window that made the anti-aircraft artillery less effective and so allowed for the, the bombers to be more effective in dropping their bombs. Already by 1943, the British had been researching the use of incendiaries for more than a year. In a recorded lecture that's no longer available to me, the historian said that this research was a direct result of what's now called the Bedecker Blitz. In the earliest stages of the war, the Germans bombed historical British cities, Bedecker being the name of a famous guide to historical places, and the English cities that were bombed in 1940 by the Germans were particularly historical and were targeted partly for that reason. 
Arthur Harris, in his book, particularly mentions the attack on Coventry. Quote, Coventry was adequately concentrated in point of space, but all the same, there was little concentration in point of time, and nothing comparable to the fire tornadoes of Hamburg and Den Dresden ever occurred in this country. But they did do us enough damage to teach us the principle of concentration, the principle of starting so many fires at the same time that no firefighting services, however efficiently and quickly they were reinforced, by the fire brigades of other towns could get them under control, unquote. So the Coventry bombing happened on the 14th and 15th of November, 1940. And you could say, compare the, the, the firestorm, the small firestorm that happened in Coventry was in part accidental, but like the discovery of penicillin that was initial accident, initially accidental, but then developed over time, so too, the later firestorms of the war were not accidental. One way to think about history is as a series of terrible accidents in which we are the mere victims of these accidents. And this can flatter human vanity because it allows us to abdicate responsibility for the things we have done. But the firestorms were intentionally engineered as weapons of war. A great deal of thought was put into them. The British set up a research division called RE8, RE standing for Research and Experiments, in November 1941. And this was headed by none other than J.D. Bernal, who I mentioned as one of the British scientific Marxisms in my episode on Christopher Hill. There is a book that mentions this research effort, The Bombing War, Europe, 1939-1945, by Richard Overy. And Overy writes, quote, it was assumed that fi city fires could be acted upon much as a pair of bellows on a domestic hearth if the wind speed and direction were favorable. Once a large conflagration has become established, wrote one of the department's scientific advisors, the firestorm which it induces is sufficient to ensure its further spread. On the advice of J.D. Bernal, wind trials were conducted by the Horton Down Experimental Station in Wiltshire using models of urban areas, while the RAF photo interpretation section provided night photographs to help in identifying the factors which accelerated the spread of fire, unquote. The best minds of the time were put to work on the problems of mass destruction. This was true with the Germans building the V1 and the V2, a very advanced technology for the time. This was true with the US with the Manhattan Project, another advanced technology of the time. And it was true of almost every scientific technological effort of the 20th century. And I think this is significant. There's a passage in Kenneth Clark's book, Civilization, that is relevant in a roundabout way, perhaps. I'll try to explain. Clark writes, quote, people sometimes wonder why the Renaissance Italians, with their intelligent curiosity, didn't make more of a contribution to the history of thought. The reason is that the most profound thought of the time was not expressed in words, but in visual imagery, unquote. Several chapters later, he, he returns to this idea and writes, quote, in a period when poetry was almost dead, when the visual arts were little more than a shadow of what they had been, when the emotional life seemed almost to have dried up, music expressed the most serious thoughts and intuitions of the time, just as painting had done in the early 16th century. Unquote. The principle behind these observations is that in different periods of history, the most profound thought of the time takes different forms. And in the same spirit, we could say that the most profound thought of the 20th century was expressed in what the philosopher Edith Weishagrod called man-made mass death in her book, uh, Spirit in Ashes. Weishagrod develops an account of what she calls the death world, which is formulated in contrast to Husserl's life world or Lebensweg. And she uses the death world to explain what she calls the death event, which dominates the 20th century. In her exposition of the death world, she has a section where she develops with the idea of she calls the historical a priori by which reason is developed in history. In my episodes on David Strauss and on Vogelin and Husserl, 
I touched on how one of the central problems of the philosophy of history is the relationship of reason to history. Does reason manifest itself in history? And if it does, how does it manifest in history? Or does history have nothing to do with reason? Why should God wrote in Spirit and Ashes, quote, the death event with its vortex of the death world seems to have established once and for all the radical incommensurability of reason and history, unquote. While I find Reichergaard's analysis interesting, I think this I think this particular claim about the incommensurability of history and reason are is wrong. And I would say that what Weishagrod calls the death world provides a novel way to structure rationality and to realize it in history. And the 20th century saw this play out in its world wars. The possibility of this kind of mass warfare had been foreseen by military visionaries. The Italian general Giulio Due, who lived from 1869 to 1930, so he did not live to see the Second World War, but he did see the First World War, and he saw what aircraft did in the First World War. Due was a military visionary for air power, no less than Alfred Thayer Mahan was a visionary for sea power. And his 1921 book, The Command of the Air, he wrote, quote, Air power makes it possible not only to make high explosive bombing raids over the, any sector of the enemy's territory, but also to ravage his whole country by chemical and bacteriological warfare. Now it is possible to go far behind the fortified lines of defense without first breaking through to them, without first breaking through them. It is air power that makes this possible. By virtue of this new weapon, the repercussions of war are no longer limited by the farthest military range of surface guns, but can be directly felt for hundreds and hundreds of miles all over the lands and seas of nations at war. No longer can areas exist in which life can be lived in safety and tranquility, nor can the battlefield any longer be limited to actual combatants. On the contrary, the battlefield will be limited only by the boundaries of the nations at war, and all their citizens will become combatants, since all of them will be exposed to the aerial offensives of the enemy." Unquote. And in the same book, Douay presented what could be considered the inevitable logic of strategic bombing long before its proof of concept in the Second World War. Quote, the people, especially in the period just prior to the World War, began to realize their power and almost unconsciously came to feel that it was absurd to let their fate hang upon the outcome of a conflict fought by only a part of their total strength, unquote. And adds a little bit further on, quote, when two men or two animals fight to the death, they throw all their strength into the struggle. They have a single aim, to win. Once the peoples of nations become aware of their individualities, the same thing was bound to happen in the struggle between nations. All their strengths and resources are bound to be entered into the game. All saving is vain for him who is about to die." Unquote. The same year that Douay's book, This Command of the Air, came out, 1921, in America, Billy Mitchell organized a demonstration to prove that aircraft can sink a ship. Now, the establishment military was opposed to this and uh, didn't even want the demonstration to happen, but uh, Billy Mitchell was able to make it happen and uh, using planes, a German battleship that had been taken from the First World War was sunk. So despite the resistance of the institutionalized military to this, the demonstration was successful and this effectively marked the beginning of the end for battleships. And it was to prove decisive in the largest carrier battle of history, which was the Battle of Midway, the turning point of the war in the Pacific, when a handful of dauntless dive bombers crippled Japanese carriers that were later scuttled by their crews. We don't see these naval engagements in the same way we look at the bombing campaigns, I assume mostly because civilians were not targeted as they were in the area bombing campaigns. But both are developments of scientific and technological reason in the service of what Weishagrod called man-made mass death. It employed not only technical expertise, but as we've seen, 
inspired and visionary thinking. As devastating as the conventional air raids were, it was the use of atomic bombs at the end of the war that caused philosophers to reflect after the fact. The instantaneous destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki became a symbol of the misuse of human intelligence. Carl Jaspers realized that human beings now had the technical capacity to destroy ourselves, which he called the new fact of history. This is in his book uh, translated as The Future of Mankind, in which he wrote, quote, experts say definitely that it is now possible for life on earth to be wiped out by human action. The scientists who brought the new fact into being have also publicized it. Neither they nor we laymen know how far atomic weapons manufacture has progressed, though each of us can ap apprehend that America and Russia, trailed by England, keep bending every effort to pile up more such bombs and to increase their destructiveness. The facts are shroud shrouded in official secrecy. It is not publicly known whether, if all bombs and stock were dropped, the radioactive poisoning of the atmosphere would suffice to end life on the planet. One may be right in doubting that the day has come when all life on Earth can be annihilated, but in 10 years or less, the day will come. This slight difference in time does not diminish the urgent need for reflection, unquote. In Weishagrod's terms, the new fact that was realized by Jaspers was the death event. And we could argue that this realization of the new fact or the death event, whatever we want to call it, the realization itself was distinct from the particulars of atomic weapons. And the realization would have dawned one way or another without, with or without the advent of nuclear technology at the end of the Second World War. The Dresden and Tokyo raids demonstrated that cities could be destroyed in a single night with conventional air power but it came at considerable effort and expense. In a post-war essay, Oppenheimer rightly pointed out that the difference between Dresden and Hiroshima was a matter of cost from his essay. I think it was published in One World or None. Quote, in this past war, it cost the United States about $10 a pound to deliver explosive to an enemy target. 50,000 tons of explosive would thus cost a billion dollars to deliver. Although no precise estimates of the cost, making an atomic bomb equivalent to 50,000 tons of ordinary explosive in, high, in energy release can now be given, it seems certain that such costs might be several hundred times less, possibly a thousand times less. Ton for equivalent ton, atomic explosives are vastly cheaper than ordinary explosives. Before conclusions can be drawn from this fact, a number of points must be looked at. It will turn out but it will turn out that the immediate conclusion is right. Atomic explosives vastly increase the power of destruction per dollar spent, per man hour invested. They profoundly upset the precarious balance between the effort necessary to, to destroy and the extent of the destruction, unquote. For, Oppenheimer, for Oppenheimer, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were proof of concept that it was possible to destroy cities quickly and cheaply. And the cheapness is worth discussing. Nuclear weapons were, in a sense, a workaround for the expense of destroying cities piecemeal had been, as had been done earlier in the war. I take it as a fundamental proposition of the philosophy of technology that before a technology is built, no one knows if it will work or how well it will work or if it can be engineered into something useful and, and practical. Unsuccessful attempts to engineer a technology do not prove it to be impossible, though they may, produce, they may prove it to be less likely and more difficult to develop. It's once a technology is built that we can determine if it works well or if it works poorly. That is to say, we can determine the engineering possibilities and limits of a technology. And this can be the occasion of considerable technological ingenuity and a further exercise of scientific and technical reason. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was right though, and because he was right, the arms race began. 
Oppenheimer also said with the building of the atomic bomb that scientists had known sin. Jasper has pointed out that the scientists were among the first to raise the alarm over what he called the new fact. And philosophers like Bertrand Russell and scientists like Linus Pauling, Pauling became activists campaigning for nuclear disarmament. But raising the alarm and becoming an activist doesn't settle the question. We still have our conscience to grapple with after the fact. And sometimes it takes a long time. It was many, many decades after the war that A.C. Grayling wrote a book called Among the Dead Cities Was the Allied Bombing of Civilians in World War II a Necessity or a Crime? And Grayling was among the first to very explicitly take up the question of whether the area bombing was justified or not. Grayling wrote, quote, Dresden was a city of great beauty, one of the cultural treasures of Europe, and its immolation occurred at a time and in circumstances which many have found hard to justify. The firebombing of Tokyo caused even greater immediate loss of life than the devastation of Hiroshima. The autumn bomb attacks were different again. They were sui generis, involving the use of a new weapon of unprecedented destructive power, the manner of, the manner of whose effects on the cities and the people, especially as regards the latter, the lingering effects of radiation sickness and the still longer term effects of illness and trauma had no parallel even in the worst episodes of bombing in that or any other war, unquote. But Arthur Harris, whose book I quoted earlier, did explicitly defend the bombing campaign on moral grounds. He wrote, quote, in spite of all that happened at Hamburg, bombing proved a comparatively humane method for one thing, it saved the flower of the use of this country, of their ally, and of their allies from being mown down by the military in the field, as was in Flanders in the war of 1914-1918. But the point is often made that bombing is specifically wicked because it causes casualties among civilians. This is true, but then all wars have caused casualties among civilians, unquote. Harris also explicitly cited the parallelism of 20th century bombing campaigns with pre-modern warfare. Quote, I never forget, as so many do, that in all normal warfare of the past and of the not distant past, it was the common practice to besiege cities, and if they refused to surrender when called upon with due formality to do so, every living thing in them was in the end put to the sword. Even in the more civilized times of today, the siege of cities accompanied by the bombardment of the city as a whole, is still a normal practice, unquote. We often invoke historical parallels and analogies trying to understand some unprecedented development in history, even knowing that the parallel is inadequate because we're grasping a straw. We're trying to understand what seems to be absolutely new, but may not be absolutely new. We don't really have a standard for quantifying historical novelty. Exactly 687 years before the bombing of Dresden and 766 years before today, the sack of Baghdad was taking place. Baghdad was the capital of the Basid Caliphate and it was besieged by Mongol forces under Hulagu. They laid siege to Baghdad for 13 days from the 29th of January, 1258, until the 10th of February, 1258, with troops said to have entered the city on the 13th of February, 1258. There are some accounts that say that there, were a, there was a three-day pause before the sack of Baghdad began in earnest on the 13th of February, but there is an account that seems to be from the time by Al-Awadi al gaima that says, quote, the inhabitants of Baghdad were put under the sword on Monday, February 11th, and were subjected to 40 days of continuous killing, pillaging, enslavement. And they tormented the inhabitants using different ways to torture and extort their wealth with severe punishment. They killed men, women, youth, and children. A great part of the city, including the Caliph's mosque and its surroundings were burnt and the city was laid in ruins. The dead lay in mounds in the streets and the markets. 
rain fell on them, horses trampled down upon them, their faces were defigure, disfigured, and they became an example to anyone who saw them. Then peace was proclaimed, and those that were left came out from hiding." Unquote. The destruction of cities is no modern innovation. We have been doing this for thousands of years. Even in antiquity, we will recall the famous line from the book of Revelation, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. It took 40 days to destroy Baghdad in 1258. It took three days to destroy Dresden in 1945. And it took a few seconds to destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki, also in 1945. We can argue over whether mass death has a long history or it represents something absolutely new in history. Certainly war isn't new, but we could argue that kinds of war are new. We could say that the Second World War was a new kind of war because it involved this kind of man-made mass death that we did not see earlier in human history. But human history is largely a story of warfare. I've often said that philosophy of history is a close cousin of the philosophy of war. I could also add that philosophy of technology is equally closely related to both history and war, as implied by my comments on the scientific and technological use of reason to realize man-made mass death. So it's difficult to be enthusiastic about Valentine's Day when we know that it is an anniversary of these kind of uh, historical events of mass death. But human history is not only a story of warfare, we could also call it the dialectic of Eros and Thanatos, and both are represented on this day. So thanks for listening.